computer again messed up my beautiful slide. <laughs> or at least I see it as a beautiful slide, maybe you don't. And the message is called today of how much value is a man? How much value is a man? Joe briefly touched this topic last Sunday. We are very valuable to God. God loves us very much. And because he loves us so much, he sent his only begotten son, right? But also when we speak about his son, we have to remember that his son also represents a God's hand, God's hand, outstretched, strong, powerful hand, which had been given to us as a matter of support and help to lift us up very often from the situation of desperation or loneliness. I told you so many times that loneliness is a big, big trick of the devil and also a big problem of human souls and minds. The truth is that we are never alone, never. It is not possible for us to be alone because God is omnipresent. But the problem is that humans sometimes they feel that they are lonely. Not because they are lonely, but because they feel it. And in order to not feel it, maybe a little bit earlier, they have to commit themselves to God. And then they will always have companionship with God, wherever they are. doesn't matter how many people around them. Actually, the truth is that some people feel lonely in the midst of a crowd. That's right. There could be hundreds and thousands of people around them, and they still feel themselves lonely. Because they're not their own best friend. Exactly. They have to have friendship with whom? God. With God. With yourself, yes, and with God. And then loneliness will be gone. And as I said, uh, the God's hand is a very big subtopic when we talk about how valuable is man. And I brought some portions from the scripture to understand that the issue of a hand is very important in the scripture when it comes to the people's freedom, to people's wellness, and to the matter also of God's love and God's support to us. First portion I took from Psalm 137 just to give you more deeper understanding of what was going on in the history of Israel, in the history of humanity when they have been captivated by Babylonians, by powerful empire. Also, I want to tell you that the issue of empire itself, the issue of empire itself is connected with our captivity as humans. In every empire, human beings are in captivity, in every empire, doesn't matter what empire, ancient one, modern one, the empire of today's, the system of empire is made in order to hold us in captivity. But God can grant to us freedom, doesn't matter in what empire we dwell. But in, in the case of Judah, kingdom of Judah, they've been taken into captivity by powerful king Nebuchadnezzar, you know him, and they've been driven to Babylon. I always thought that they've been treated as slaves. And recently, what is interesting, recently they have been discovered 100 palm-sized tablets with inscription of Jewish life in Babylon. And in that inscription, uh, there, there is information that they have not been treated as slaves. They have been treated as administrators, it's been giving to them administration business and also they've been merchants in Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar was very smart. He took people from kingdom of Judah, brought them to Babylon and let them be administrators and merchants in order to his economy prosper. He was very smart and wise man. And as you know, at the close to the end of his life, he got revelation about God of heaven and earth. And I think still today there are many Christians who are I would say, branches of the tree which God built through this king. So the, this portion I called, If I Forget You, Jerusalem. You know that there are many churches today who do not consider Jerusalem as an important city. They do not consider Jerusalem as a holy site where God placed his holy name eternally. There are many churches who do not believe in that. And for those churches, it is a good lesson so Psalm 137, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Sion. I purposely removed Z and put S because the correct pronunciation is Sion, not Zion. Zion, I already told you, had been embedded by lovers of Zeus. 
So when we remember Sion, the place of their native land, of course they wept and sat in a sadness. There on, on the poplars we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. No one asked, you know, inhabitants of Judah, would they like to be in Babylon? They just took them by the force and forced them to be administrators and merchants and uh, I think all other workers. And of course they left their souls and their hearts back in the kingdom of Judah and they were in a deep depression. But their tormentors demanded songs of joy from them. They said, sing us one of the songs of Sion. Who knows, maybe God could use those depressed people when they would sing those songs to getting revelation to their tormentors. Maybe their tormentors will be changed. We never know. So sometimes we do have conflict in our souls when our souls are down, but our spiritual man knows that we have to praise our Lord, right? And we never know what's going to happen with our souls and with people around us. Maybe people are also in depression and when we will worship our Lord, maybe they will be released from that depression or that captivity in their souls. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? That's humanly understandable, right? But spiritually, not really. And verse 5 is very important, 5, 6. You see in those verses 5 and sing, there is a curse placed upon those who forgot about Jerusalem and Mount Sion. Doesn't matter what denomination, doesn't matter how religious those people are. We should always keep that in mind. If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you again, Jerusalem. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. And you see this curse targeting two areas, hands and tongue. Hands, basically, we will touch the story, why I brought this to you also, because in our Gospel of Mark, beloved Gospel of Mark, we will see occasion of a man with a withered hand hand which was in atrophy, had been restored to its health and wellness inside of the synagogue. But also we see the issue of tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. It could be a stroke when people lose ability to speak. And how often did you remember that when you pray for people who got stroke to confess the sin of absence of interest, of absence of focus in their lives toward Jerusalem, toward Mount Sion, toward the Holy Land of Israel. Not often, right? But next time if you will pray for people who have problems with the mobility of their hands or in their, their speech impairment, remember that it could be the cause, the main cause. Because God is faithful. If he says something in his word, he will accomplish that. He will act exactly as he said. Just to understand you before we'll come to the occasion of the man with wizard hand, what it is. Atrophy, medical term, atrophy, definition. It speaks about body tissue or an organ waste away, especially as a result of the degeneration of cells or become vestigial, forming a very small remnant of something during evolution. During human history, we know that God preserves a remnant. Because humanity in general, in a state of vestigial processes during evolution of humanity, the human choices, human absence of interest, human mistakes lead us into vestigial state of our society. And the fires, I believe, and Tanya believes too, that those fires in, in Australia are a result of human decisions, choices, and actions. Scripture teaches us that animal world and nature suffers when humans do poor, you know, make poor decisions, poor, make poor choices, and in general they are not ignorant about responsibility for the wellness yeah. of the nature and human. Yes, and floods. Same area, floods and fires, all those disasters, I believe, are results of our poor management as humans. But God always preserves a remnant in the midst of those vestigial processes. 
Next line is gradual decline in effectiveness or vigor due to underuse or neglect. Michelle said today rightly that we have to be our own friends. We have, we have to be our own managers. Friends. Yes, best friends. We have to be our own best friends because best friends know and understand any processes or changes which happen with their friend. We have to learn actually. Naturally, we are not good friends of ourselves. We have to learn. If you're your own best friend, you're inclined to meet somebody who's going to be with you. Yes. We have to, yes, we have to understand ourselves and we have to take proper care, we have to be effective, otherwise we will decline in effectiveness. And God doesn't want for us to lose effectiveness. No. He wants for us to be strong and capable to accomplish what has been given to us as a mission. We should not neglect our own time of rest. We should not neglect our soul. We have to give a little bit time to our soul to rejoice to do what soul likes to do. We are responsible for that. We have to separate time for our soul. When we speak about our walk with Christ, it doesn't mean that we are only spiritual beings. We are also soulish beings. I'm talking about proper things. Proper things, because if we will give full freedom to our soul, our soul can pull us into something which is prohibited. But what is not prohibited should be given to our soul at the time which is, which is separated to it. And then uh, we will have friendship with our soul. And another portion from scripture, book of Zephaniah is famous, chapter 3, famous by by explanation of the first fail and rebellion of Jerusalem and then by explanation to us of God's grace and provision and love in his promises to restoration, about restoration. You should remember that Jesus restored withered hand to its proper function. Restoration was involved with Jesus' case too. I mean, with this man with withered hand. So Zephaniah chapter 3 verses 1 through 5. When hypocrites rule, I named that. But it could be another name for this slide. When Jerusalem is in atrophy of righteousness. What sorrow awaits rebellious, polluted Jerusalem? The city of violence and crime. Very, very sad message comes from Zephaniah. His heart is weeping about Jerusalem, which is supposed to be a holy city of the Most High God, and instead he calls that Jerusalem the city of violence and crime. Why? Because of rebellious people who dwell in this city. And also he starts, what sorrow awaits. Since our childhood, you know, since our childhood, parents discipline us. For what purposes? To teach, us. So we don't to teach for us. Do not get in trouble. Do not get those sorrows. Right from wrong. Yes. They teach us. They navigate us down the life way in order for us to escape sorrows. Because rebellion will always face a sorrow. That's God's promise through Zephaniah. No one can tell to Jerusalem anything. It refuses all correction. Tell me now, is it, is it common to discipline children, to tell them what is right or what is wrong from the parents' side? Or society is trying now to separate children from parents? If you will, if you will be too much you know, insisting to tell your, your children what is right and what is wrong, eventually they can you know, call to police and complain. They all know the number. Yes. And they can manipulate with this number. <laughs> Even in school. Do you know how hard today for teachers to function properly in schools? No one can tell to this city anything. It refuses all correction. It does not trust in the Lord or draw near to its God, to its God who wants to help, who wants to correct. And now, description of four group of people who are responsible for this iniquity, for this rebellion. Leaders, judges, prophets, and priests. Four 
institutes of those who are responsible for the situation. It's still today. What I'm talking right now, it's not only about ancient Jerusalem. I'm talking about modern Jerusalem. I'm talking about modern every city on this planet Earth. I'm talking about every church on this planet Earth. Every institution on this planet Earth. Same principle. First one, leaders are like roaring lions hunting for their victims. Its judges are like ravenous wolves at evening time, who by dawn have left no trace of their prey, no any mercy, no any compassion, nothing, devoured anything and everything what they touch. Judges, what judges supposed to do? They supposed to bring justice. Instead, they, they are, they are predators. Yes. Its prophets are arrogant liars. Seeking their own gain. Instead of bringing the truth, they just in a search of their own gain. Its priests defile the temple by disobeying God's instructions. If you will ask today in any church how many instructions God gave, do you remember? Do you still remember the number of instructions? Six hundred thirteen. Not many churches will bring to you even number of instructions. I'm not talking about explanation of those instructions or, or knowledge about those instructions. And what it brings? It brings absence of cleanliness, spiritual cleanliness. So when we disobey God's commandments, we bring uncleanliness into our own lives and into lives of people who are around us. And I believe that Land suffers because land is filled so much by this uncleanness, by this rebellion, by these pollutions. Verse 5, but the Lord, but the Lord is still there in Jerusalem. And he does no wrong. Why Lord does not remove himself from Jerusalem? Because he promised to be there eternally. And same in our situations, in the midst of our lives, and I would say at the center of our lives, there is Lord who placed himself because he loves us. And any moment he can spark, he can shine right from the center of our lives in order to help us. That is why I'm saying when a person feels himself or herself lonely, it is not because he or she is lonely, it is because they are blind they are stubborn, they are polluted by something, and they are not able to stretch their hands and to look at the Lord who is nearby to help. He is ready to help. Day by day, he hands down justice. Very interesting expression, hands down. With the use of his hand, he puts down his justice, down to people. So his hand is connected with his justice. And he does not fail in doing that, says Zephaniah. But the wicked know no shame. They have no understanding and even interest about knowing that it is shameful to rebel against the Lord. It is shameful to rebel against God's commandments with an excuse of the grace which is very popular today, to abolish any regulations of God with expression of grace. I am under grace. Don't touch me. Don't tell me anything. Do not tell me anything. You are legalist. If you tell me something about God's instructions, you are legalist. Don't touch me. I am a believer of the New Testament. I am a New Testament believer, so I am under grace. I can do whatever I want according to my cultural values, cultural traditions. Little more understanding from medical standpoint about withered hand, just for us to be experts. Hand atrophy is a condition that causes muscles of the hand deteriorate, deteriorate, and deteriorate and and wither away. Yeah, actually, English is one of the most hardest languages I can speak. Turkish, I can say even words in Arabic, in Hebrew, in Greek. 
in Russian, in Ukrainian, but when it comes to English, sometimes my tongue doesn't listen to me. Also called muscle wasting, hand atrophy leads the muscles to begin to lose their bulk and strength. This in turn may cause a general decrease in the ability of the hand to move, of course. Health conditions such as uh, gallium, bear, and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or ALS, thank you, can trigger the deterioration, deterioration of muscles all over the body, including the hand. This loss of movement increases the risk of a reduction in muscle tone or atrophy, especially in the hand. This disease kills the nerves which control the contraction or movement of muscles throughout the body. When enough nerve cells are destroyed, the entire body loses the ability to function. Entire body. So what Jesus has done with this man, he restored not only his hand, he restored his life to full capacity in front of people whose minds and souls were withered by their rebellion and the search of their own gain. They've had knowledge of the scripture, but because of the search of their gain, they denied those commandments. They denied God's mercy. They denied God's love and chased just their own gain and power. That is why they hated Jesus so much. And now we are ready to the gospel. See how big and long I've done introduction before we got to the gospel. Why? Because without previous introduction, we are not ready to grasp the full picture. Not ready. Gospel is not so simple uh, scripture. You have to understand the conflict between religious leaders and Jesus as a hand of God. So it was great conflict between wizard hands, minds, and souls and hearts of people and God's hand which God outstretched to help them. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good, said Jesus to hypocrites in one gospel? And from another gospel we read that hypocrites themselves ask this question. Is it lawful to do that on Sabbath? Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6, a man with a withered hand. Again, Jesus entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand. Was it visible? Do you know that Stalin himself was a man with a withered hand? But Stalin not only has been with a withered hand, he also was a man with a withered heart. That's what's most dangerous. That is why he caused millions of people to suffer and die. Scholars say today that approximately 90 million people perished during his rulership. 9-0 million. How many did uh, Hitler kill? It's hard to say, but I would say uh, approximately 40, 40. So he entered the synagogue, a man was there with a wizard hand, and they, who they? Pharisees, leaders. Who are supposed to be leaders, who are supposed to be prophets, who are supposed to be priests. They watched Jesus to see whether he would heal man on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. They did not care about the struggles of a man. They did not care about struggles of people in general. All what they were interested about to preserve their authority, their power and control over society. And of course they knew that Jesus definitely will help this man. Because that is why he came. And he said to the man, very interesting, he said to the man and he said to the Pharisees. First he said to the man with the withered hand. And I want to ask a question, why Mark all the time repeats to the man with the withered hand, to the man with the withered hand? Why he repeats all the time that? Is it enough just to mention once? What he wants to tell us if he repeats several times withered hand? Remember, Remember what? That man was with problems, right? Physical. But was this man alone with a withered hand in this synagogue? What about other people? I told you already several times. They've had withered minds. They've had withered hearts. They had withered souls. So he was not alone in this synagogue with his problem. There was full room of people with problems. But he said to him, come here. And then immediately he said to, <laughs> to Pharisees, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? So he wanted to do good. 
He wanted to save life. They wanted to do harm and they wanted to kill Jesus at the same time. Basically, this question was from Jesus' standpoint, was rhetoric. He did not need any answers. He knew perfectly what were in their minds, what he told them. I came to help to this man. You came here to kill me. I came to do good to this man. You came to this synagogue to do harm to me and to all other people. That's what basically you do in your life. That's what he said to them. And he started, is it lawful? He told them, I know that you're basically talking all the time about law and what is lawful. But does it really problem to do good? No. According to their Talmud, according to their religious books, and he will use that in another gospel, if a donkey or an animal will be dropped into the pit during Sabbath, they have to pull it. He knew that, and he uses that in order to show them that they are wrong even in what they written in their own religious books. But they were silent. They were silent. Of course, what they could tell, he was absolutely right. And verse 5, and he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart. Do you see how beautiful heart of Jesus we are able to see here? He was very angry, but at the same time, he loved them and he grieved at their hardness of hearts. So they were blind. They were with withered hearts, minds, and souls because of the hardness. How come hardness can enter our lives? How can hardness can enter my life and yours? In what way? Yes, when we are hurt by people, when we experience pain, when we experience losses, and we think that those losses are not just, why did I lose my mom. Have you seen children who were greatly harmed because they lost their moms at the age of four or five? Terrible, terrible trauma. Subconsciously, that child keeps asking God, subconsciously, why it was happening with me? What have I done wrong? Some children think that because they've done something wrong, they lost their parents. And then... They don't listen to the children. Yes. And then hardness hardness enters hearts yes. of those children and they become deaf and blind when you try to reach them they do not respond to you that's how loneliness loneliness enters those people's world and then doesn't matter how many people around they still behind this scale of pain scale of losses rejection and they do not listen to you they live in balloon balloon you see them but they, they are not hear you they are not able to hear you that is why God stretched his arm, like in this synagogue. God brought his arm to help people around, but they came to kill him. That's how blind and stubborn and deaf they were. Yes. He was with anger, but grieved at their hardness of heart. That's how God, our God is. He loves even when he in his righteous wrath, he still loves us. And he said to the man, Please note, Mark doesn't anymore use man with a withered hand. Withered hand is omitted. Have you noticed? Yeah. Withered hand is omitted. Why? Because time came. Time came for that man not to be anymore with withered hand. That is why Mark omitted this part of the sentence. Stretch out your hand. What Jesus says today to you and to me, what Jesus says today to me and to you. He is here right now. He is here. He is omnipresent. He says, stretch out your pain. Stretch out your rejection. Stretch out your anger. Stretch out your wounds to me. You could tell where I have to stretch it. Expose it. Expose it. Do not hide it. Do not harbor it. Stretch it. And man obeyed. He stretched it out. And his hand was restored. What if man would not stretch it? Yes. Probably he will still be with that problem. So obedience. When God says, come to me, all you who are burdened, come to me. 
and I will give you rest. But we do not come to him. We have excuses. Why should I come to him? Why he didn't bring rest to me yesterday and one week ago or 10 years ago? I'm still troubled because we were deaf 10 years ago. If we hear it today, God says, do not harden your hearts right now. Do not make your excuses about 10 years ago. Be alive right now. If he wants to heal you right now, let him do so. Stretch. Our business is to stretch our problem to him. His business is to deal with that problem. His hand was restored. It doesn't say he was healed. Was restoration. Rest came into his life. Rest, completeness came into his life. Rest and completeness are the same. We're struggling not because we are not talented. We're struggling not because we are not enough smart. We're struggling because we do not have completeness. And God brought this completeness to us. It is called shalom. Shalom is completeness, complete support, complete capability, complete ability to function properly according to God's image in us, according to God's plan for us. The Pharisees went out their reaction and immediately held counsel with Herodians against Jesus how to destroy him. That's all what they wanted. That's all what they planned. That's what all what they were interested about. Please note, Pharisees and Herodians. Pharisees are Judaic system. Herodians are Hellenistic system. People who belong to two systems of, of cultural and religious Systems, two worlds, but both hated Jesus. Both Hellenistic and people who who stayed in Judaism, they both hated Jesus because they were afraid of losing power and control over society. Herodians were a sect or party of Hellenistic Jews mentioned in the New Testament as having on two occasions. First in Galilee, they tried to annihilate Jesus, and later in Jerusalem, manifested an unfriendly disposition toward Jesus. Mark, Matthew, Luke and Book of Acts speak about that. Just very briefly, uh, point of view of Matthew. We should remember that Mark was the first gospel written. Matthew wrote later with the use of Mark's text. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. A man with a withered hand. Jesus went on from there and entered their synagogue. And a man was there with a withered hand, and they asked Jesus. They asked Jesus, says Matthew, Pharisees. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Please note, in the previous gospel, he says, is it lawful to, to do good or to do harm? In this gospel, they say, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him? He said to them, which one of you who has a ship, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a ship? So it is lawful, so it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Not heal, but to do good. That's how Jesus responded on this question. Also, he underlined that man is more valuable than an animal. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out and it was restored healthy like the other. Was restored healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy Jesus. All what they were interested about to destroy him, to eliminate obstacle for their rulership. This is last one. It's also a continuation if you notice the book of Zephaniah. Also what is famous book of Zephaniah and particularly chapter 3, it speaks about God who is dancing. And his dance over us is like that. Literal meaning. I don't know, he's spinning from the right to the left or from the left to the right. I don't know, scripture doesn't tell us. But he's spinning around people because of he rejoices over his children. That's what scripture teaches us about. In that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, do not be afraid, Sion. And you know that Jerusalem is situated on Mount Sion. Don't let your hands be weak. See what God says? Do not let your hands be to be withered. And, and how it is connected with our memory, what Zephaniah said in the previous verses, if I forget, what? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. 
Do not let, so what God says through Zephaniah, do not let you forget yourself to forget Jerusalem. Do not let your hands be weak. The Lord your God is among you as a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with joy, with a dancing, spinning. With joy, he will calm you in his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. He will calm you in his love. But we have to allow him. We have to stretch to him our problems. We have to expose our weaknesses. We have to expose to him areas where we are withered. Let him deal with that. But we have to be obedient. We have to be obedient. We have to be obedient. We have to deliver problem to him. It is not about his inability to help. It is about our stubborn desire do not obey to him. That's where problem is. He wants to bring to us completeness, but we prefer to stay in our cocoon, in our balloon. That's right. Let us concentrate now on our, on our areas where we have this withered hand or withered emotions or withered hope or wizard I don't know what else pain something what is ancient from ancient time maybe you've been offended by your parents neglected by your parents in some areas and you felt yourself lonely I would sing this song to you I am lonely but this song is very very bad it is a great suffering when we feel lonely ourselves it is great suffering in it so let us go deeper inside of us and examine what is harboring inside of us loneliness or bitterness or or pain pain because we never been maybe understood properly by our parents or by our schoolmates or even as as Michelle said, maybe we never been good friends to ourselves. You know, there are so many people who hate themselves. No. We all have reasons to hate ourselves. Those reasons are false reasons. They are not really reasons based on love. But we still, you know, do not like ourselves for some reasons. I never cried when reasons. my mom died. I never cried when my dad died. See, uh, when we do not cry. I don't miss them. Yes, but when we do not cry. When it's time to cry, it speaks about hardness of hearts. People whose hearts are hardened, they do not cry. God created us to cry when it is time to cry. He teaches us through scripture, but we are silent. Because by, by pain, by you know, difficulties and troubles, we learn. Stay quiet, do not express anything. We should express. God wants, maybe he wants for us to cry now. Yes, scripture teaches us when we cry, our heart becomes better. Our hearts can be softened when we cry. When I met Christ, I cried and cried and cried day and night. I couldn't stop. And I noticed that because I cried, my heart became softer and softer. Why were you crying? I love, I, love cho- I love other people's children. I help other people who don't even know me. It's because I've, I've learned to help other people. Yeah. But, but we have to also learn to forgive. Yes. We have to learn to forgive. Amen. Especially if, we, if our parents never been forgiven by us. It is very, very bad. Let us, let us forgive now. Let us start with our parents. Sorry. Let us start with ourselves. Before we come to parents, we have to start with ourselves. God said, love others as Yourself. You love yourself. So we have to start with ourselves. Let us start now. Father God, in Jesus' name, can you repeat with me? Father God, in Jesus' name, I confess before you the sin which is unforgiveness of myself. And now you can mention for what you haven't forgiven yourself. Quietly, quietly. It's between you and God. Maybe you failed in some areas and you still never f- forgave yourself for it. It's time now to forgive. God never placed you to be most harsh judge for yourself. 
He loves you and accepts you as you are. In Jesus' name, I forgive myself. And you can quietly mention for what? I accept myself. I love myself. Because you say so. It is your commandment to love myself. And now it's time for our parents. Father God, in Jesus' name, I confess unforgiveness of my parents. Now you you can mention quietly for what you did not forgive them. In Jesus' name, if they are alive, then say, I forgive them in Jesus' name. If they are passed away, just confess that. And Father God, in Jesus' name, I cut myself from any traces which are coming from the past, from this unforgiveness. I cut myself from any traces which come from the past, which are connected with rejection, bitterness. I give all bitterness to you. Give all bitterness to him. Maybe someone else offended you. Maybe it was your best friend or your spouse. In Jesus' name, I open myself for your healing and restoration. I open myself to the full and proper functioning in your body. I accept all riches of your glory given to me. I receive your power of the Spirit of the Holy One to accomplish what was given to me as a part of my mission. And speaking about the hand, since we talk about the hand, there is someone here in this room who has problems with raising his hand above the shoulder level. Someone. In Jesus' name, may your hand will be restored now for full, proper functioning. Because God has called you to be his ambassador to be his hands, to be his feet, his eyes and ears, to be his ambassador of love and acceptance. And he gave you this permission to do good, which is above any restrictions, not to bring harm to yourself and to people, but to bring restoration, to bring life. Even may your mouth, your words would be his words, words of restoration, of hope, joy, and salvation to those who haven't heard yet or who do not understand yet. May they, may, you will make the way to their hearts and souls as God's messenger. In Jesus' name we are praying. Amen.